from the headquarters of Fightback Media, The Morning Report, with your host, Willie Lawson. Good morning, good morning, and welcome to the Morning Report. My name is Willie Lawson. I trust that you are well this glorious, fantastic, incredible. Hang on a second. We've got some music playing. Oh, there you go. Uh, (laughs) Ever seen that um, that meme where where the guy goes, I feel like I've got, you know, 14 windows open on my computer, and I can't tell where the music is coming from. Ever been there? Me. Me right now. Uh, but anyway, we um, got that solved. Thank you ever again for thank you again for coming to the morning report. It is Monday, September 12th. It's my kid's birthday. Rock and roll. Um, yesterday was the 11th of September. And um, I hope that you were able to attend um, some 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 services in remembrance of what happened on that faithful day, fateful day. Uh, on, on September 11th, 2001. Uh, uh, there are a lot of, and oh, and we put a video up um, commemorating um, what happened, uh, reminding people. I, I think commemorating is probably a bad word, reminding people what happened to this nation on that day. Um, and, it's, and it is important to remember it is incredibly important to remember that we are not a place that is uh, impervious to such horror, because we are we, we truly were not. Over 3,000 lives lost that, that day, and then so many afterwards with cancer and um, suicide and all sorts of other um, ailments and maladies uh, from that day, uh, we're, we're not just talking about the people who were in the towers when they collapsed, but people who were, who were in and around the towers when they collapsed. The all, you know a, a lot of the um, the first responders, healthcare workers, and the like um, that were in and around the towers when they collapsed, and uh, you know breathing in all that noxious nastiness that um, we put up in buildings. Uh, because a plastic, a lot of it's plastic. A lot of things, when they're burned, become carcinogens, apparently. Uh, and I think we always have to remember that. And so we are still suffering. People are still suffering. People are still suffering 21 years later. Uh, not just the physical elements, but the, uh, but the, uh, the psychological and emotional trauma. Uh, and our hearts here at Fight Back Media go out to all of them. 
we will never forget here. We will never uh, have a time, a year where we won't remember, where we won't remember where we were. And for those of you who are who may be younger, um, it's one of those things that we say, uh, your parents say, or your grandparents say, I remember where I was when. I remember where I was when JFK was assassinated. I remember where I was and what I was doing when MLK got assassinated. I remember what where I was and what I was doing um, at 9-11. I do. I remember it um, like it was yesterday, literally like it was yesterday. I got to school. I was working at a local high school. I was working at Bloomingdale. And I got to school late, um, but because I I could, I got to school um, after school had started. I'll say, I'll, I'll say it that way. Um, and I was walking um, into the main, one of the main hallways in between the auditorium and the gym. And a, a kid came running down the hallway and I was like, yo, yo, man, what's going on? Slow down, slow down. Uh, it was like he was being chased. And he said, my teacher has lost her effing mind. She says the world's coming to an end. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, you don't know? I said, no. A plane crashed into a building in New York. Huh. So I thought that some pilot, some Cessna 152 pilot um, in airspace they had, had no business being in, had an accident and, cra and, and crashed into a building in New York. That's the first thing that came to my mind. Wasn't it the first thing that came to your mind when you were told and you didn't see? So I, I, I made a left um, down the um, chorus and band hallway and I stopped by the first room and my friend uh, was watching TV um, and um, she we were standing there and, and just as I walked up to her, um, the second plane hit the second tower. We saw that on the TV. Uh, Bev Sutherland uh, was her name. She has since passed away. Uh, Bev and I watched the second plane crash into the second, I mean, the second tower. And we looked at each other and we said, I can't tell you what we said, but need, needless to say, we were shocked. Um, what is going on here? And then there were reports of a third plane that had crashed into the Pentagon. And then another plane um, that had crashed into a field. I mean, a few minutes later, a, a, a fourth plane that had crashed into um, a field in Pennsylvania. And they believed that that plane was headed towards the White House. Wow. Wow. It was scary. It was scary for a minute. It was. And because no one knew whether, I mean, no one knew um, if this was going to continue all day. No one knew. And all the planes and, you know, what in, in, in any airspace uh, across the entire continent of the, of the United States was um, this whole area were ordered out of the air. And again, for those of you who, um, who, who, who may be too young, uh, imagine that every plane Every plane, not just commercial planes, every plane was ordered to land. Every single one. Why did they do that? Because planes that had people on them with evil intentions would have ignored those orders. Then you would have been in a situation, a horrific situation, where those planes might have been shot down with innocent people on them. Yeah. It was, it was going to get really scary, really scary. Um, but as far as we know, that didn't happen. And um, I, would, I always say as far as we know, because we don't always know everything. They don't always tell us everything. We don't always have all of the information, ever. And, and know that we never have all, all the information. But all the planes were ordered out of the sky uh, air traffic was was shut down for a number of days, a, a week or so, I think. Um, it was different. It was different. Uh, and what was amazing was that the unity 
that people showed. It wasn't uh, it wasn't a Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative. It wasn't any of that, at least for a month or so. None of that. And I remember this is in September before November elections. Uh, and we had local uh, elections, uh, I believe. Yes, it was, a, it was zero one. Yeah, I think we had mayoral elections or, some, or city council or something like that. But there was nothing you know, what in the press was nothing uh, that back and forth that you see now, that tit for tat, nothing. And as I remember it, everywhere was quiet. It was not a lot of loud talking, loud music playing. Everything was very quiet. Grocery stores were open. Um, and I don't remember even the music in, in places being open and, you know, be on, being on or being loud. I don't, sorry, the y'all got some, got some dinner caught between my teeth still, or breakfast caught between my teeth, sorry. But, um, and I remember people were very kind to each other. People smiled at each other. People, people were asking strangers, how you doing? Everybody at your, everybody at your house okay? Um, people are being very kind to each other. And then eventually, like, mo like most things in this country, it wore off. Like most things, it wore off. But I'm telling you, we here at Fight Back Media will never forget. We, it was 21 years ago to yesterday. We will never, ever forget. All right, we'll take a little break. We'll be back with more of the program right after these messages. Thank you ever so much. Let me um, handle that. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate you being here today. Uh, one more thing before we get started, and this is not on a another not pleasant note. Um, I found out um, on Saturday afternoon, I think this happened Friday, but I found out on Saturday afternoon that a very close friend of mine, Eddie Adams Jr., um, passed away. Uh, Eddie was 68 years old, uh, a twice or three times candidate for um U.S. rep here in in my district here, um, and more and more than that, somebody who really wanted to pave a way, pave the way for a lot of us who are doing this, a lot of us who are running for office. I ran, you know, the two times I ran, he was a um, an incredible, invaluable resource uh, as far as what to do, what not to do. Um, how to make things easier, uh, offered his, you know, his help and support the entire time, you know, the entire time I was running. And then while we were doing this show uh, uh, and he was doing his own program, he was doing a thing called Porch Talk Radio. We did Porch Talk Radio on WGUL. I did a show on WGUL. We did uh, Porch Talk Radio on Blog Talk, on Blog Talk Radio. And we also did Porch Talk Radio on a um, on a local television station, uh, the public access station, and now Porch Talk Radio found its uh, home on WTMP eleven fifty, um, a legacy black radio station here in town. Um, was doing Porch Talk Radio with um, uh, my friend um, Tim Horton and um, Gabriel uh, Phillips for more than 13 years, more than a decade. And uh, really change, really starting to change minds in the African-American community about, about what Republic, Republicans and conservatism really is and how um, that the, mo the, the values of most, most black people in, you know, in the hood are more closely aligned to a conservative viewpoint than the progressive liberal one that they're being fed. And, um, had a had a really 
interesting and special way, uh, something that we can all learn from uh, of doing that, uh, embracing um, the community, making sure that you know that you don't show up and start hitting everybody with a baseball bat. That's not how you do it. You win people over in the theater of ideas. In the theater of in the theater of ideas, and Eddie was really good at that. Uh, you know, it wasn't these big debate sessions that you that some of you think that that need to be had. That wasn't it. Um, this this was simply telling things, you know, telling things as were as they as they were, uh, as they are, and um, getting people to see um, what the truth is and admit to what the truth is. And that was Eddie's methodology. And it was effective, incredibly effective because it was obvious that he cared more about the community uh, than party or ideology. He cared about the people who live there. Uh, he served on numerous boards, um, numerous boards, not just served on them, but chaired them. Uh, he also was the, the founder of one of the Gaspar La Cruz, um, the crew of Libertalia, I believe, that showed up um, the the year that Gaspar was canceled, and um, it was the year of, and I can't remember these names, of Bombaleo, and and now um, the crew the crew of Libertalia uh, performs in both the Gaspar Day Parade, the Night Parade, uh, Libertalia performs in the um, MLK Day Parade, and. The Plant City Strawberry Festival Parade as well. So, um, really bringing people together. It was one of the first, if not the first, multi multiracial uh, crews. Um, the crew has, you know, blacks and whites and Hispanics, uh, men and women. Um, it's about liberty more, more than anything. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to miss him. You know, you know how dudes do friends, right? How we do friends. We might not talk for two months or three months, but you know, something says, hey man, I need to call so-and-so. So you call them and you have a conversation like you had a conversation yesterday because that's how dudes do it, right? Um, I'm going to miss being able to, you know, a quick text, what's going on, a uh, quick call. What are you up to? I'm going to miss that. I'm going to miss having a big brother. I am going to miss having a big brother. Uh, our prayers here at Fight Back Media go to Sylvia and, and, and the rest of Eddie's family, his grandchildren, uh, his kids, uh, his, um, his siblings. And um, remember, we're only here on this planet for a short amount of time, folks. Make the best of it. All right, let's get started with the stories. I hate that man. I hate that. I hate that so much. I hate that so much. All right. Let's head out to Mon. Let's head out to Montana. The Montana uh, Department of Public Health and Human Services adopted a rule change on Friday that prohibits transgender residents from changing their sex on their state issued birth certificates after they've received gender affirming air quotes, if you can't see it, surgeries. Um, well, and before people get all, all bent out of shape, because this video is going up on YouTube, before you get all bent out of shape, when that birth certificate was issued, you were a dude. You had all the stuff of a of, of, of little boy. So that birth certificate is correct. It also said it also said that you were 21 inches long, and that was correct. There isn't any reason to go back now and put your height, your your current height, on your birth certificate, or your current or your current weight. It also says that you weighed seven seven pounds six ounces, so there's no reason to go back and correct your birth certificate for what you are now. There's no reason for that. The rule change went into effect um, this past Saturday. The new policy explains that the sex listed on the birth on the person's state issue birth certificate may only be changed in limited circumstances, such as the Scrivener's error, 
or the sex of the individual was misidentified on the original birth certificate. If they made a mistake on the birth certificate, then you could do that. Here's how it goes. Um, section B, the uh, the sex of a red of a registrant as cited on a certificate may be corrected only if uh, one, the sex of the individual was listed incorrectly on the original uh, certificate as a result of a Scrivener's error or a data entry error. And the, the department receives a correction affidavit and supporting documents consistent with uh, ARM 37.8.014, four, four uh, comma five com and six, including a copy of the records of the healthcare facility or attending healthcare professional uh, contemporaneously to, to, um, to the birth that, the, that identify the sex of the individual with an affidavit from the healthcare facility or professional testing to the date and accuracy of the records. So you gotta you gotta prove that oh there was a, there was an error. Two, the sex of the individual was misidentified on the original certificate, and the department receives a correction affidavit and supporting documents consisting with all the things I just said, including the results of a chromosomal or molecular or <laughs> these words. Uh, Carapetic DNA or, or genetic testing that identifies the sex of the individual together with the affidavit from the healthcare facility, healthcare professional, or a laboratory testing facility that conducted the test and or analyzed test results attesting to the test results of inaccuracy. So you know what? Taking your blood now and saying, I am I am I'm a chick. No, your DNA says you're a dude. PBS reported that the rule change occurred days before a court will hear arguments over a similar rule that has been in effect on a, quote, emergency basis since May. The, a the ACLU of Montana has asked the state uh, Judge Michael Moses to strike down the emergency rule. Transgender, transgender plaintiffs represented by the ACLU of Montana have said the birth certificates do not align with the transgender's gender identity, puts them at risk of embarrassment, discrimination, harassment, or violence. Not at all. Not at all. And I'll tell you why. How many people see your birth certificate? When's the last time someone saw your birth certificate? I have a new one because I had to get my license you know, renewed. So I have a new one. But And that's the first time. My God. Since, I don't know, I don't even know when that someone said, oh, we'll need a copy of your birth certificate. Who needs a copy of your birth certificate as a grown up? The same people who I know need a copy of your high school diplomas. Who? As some scientists have noted, human sex is observable, immutable, and an important biological classification. It's biological and thus genetic. Binary and immutable, the rule continued. The department and the department agrees. Uh, last year, Montana Governor Greg um, Gianforte signed uh, Senate Bill 280 into law, which required transgender residents to undergo a gender affirming surgical procedure if they wanted to change their birth certificate to match their gender identity. On trans on Transgender Day of Visibility this year, Bi the Biden administration agencies released gender promoting gender affirming care for minors. The agencies that publish the guidance claim that there are gender affirming steps that are reversible. Guidance from the from HHS Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services uh, Administration National Chair National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Goodness gracious, claim that gender affirming care is neither child maltreatment or malpractice, even though it includes puberty blockers and hormone therapy. So stopping a, a the natural maturation of a human being. because of gender identity is neither maltreatment or malpractice. The NCTSN, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, uh, guidance added that gender affirming care should not be used to, to um, deny care or separate families working to make them the best, to make the best decision for the children's well-being, alluding to how the Tex how Texas launched investigations into the parents of changes for minors for child abuse. In an interview earlier this month, 
uh, with townhall.com, uh, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton said the answer is clear regarding so-called sex change procedures, puberty blockers, and hormone therap therapies, which performed, when performed on children, these procedures are abuse under Texas law. They're illegal. And family courts, family law government agencies, and the like must do their part to stop it. It is, we're up against it, folks. We are up against it. You, you remember how um, the left keeps saying that it is, it is terrible and awful that we are not um, embracing, letting um, people into our country, even if, even illegally. Because no person is illegal, right? Check this out. In an email to Washington D.C. residents over uh, D.C. residents over the weekend, uh, Mayor Muriel Bowser explained her new plan to deal with the influx of illegal immigrants over the past six months. So, if you've been living under a rock, what um, some of, some of these governors, um, Greg Abbott um, primarily, has been taking uh, busloads of people who are crossing the border illegally and putting them on a bus ride to Washington, D.C. and dropping them off, or New York and dropping them off. Citing a, an ongoing humanitarian crisis. Remember, there wasn't a crisis at the border. This humanitarian crisis was something that people were, that the, the xenophobes were making up, that Republicans were making up. Um, that Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio and and, and the like they were they were manufacturing a crisis that wasn't there. Remember that a little bit ago. But now Muriel Bowser, Democrat mayor of of the of Washington D.C., is citing an ongoing humanitarian crisis. Bowser reassured Washington Washingtonians that their values will be honored by shipping illegal immigrants out of the city and to other parts of the country that your values, which are the values of love and acceptance, and these people are seeking, and these people are seeking a better life, and it's terrible that, that, that you would build a wall to keep them out, are taking those very same folks, those very same people, you know, I, Jose's and Maria's that I talk, that I've been talking about for years, Yes, I'm using that name in a very generic sense. Lord forgive me, um, because I'm, I'm I'm telling you, I'm not I'm not afraid of the Jose's and Marias who come to Florida, who work um, in the strawberry fields, uh, never never cause a problem, send their kids to school, because I have taught many of their children at schools that I've worked at. Um, those are the people. Those aren't the people I'm worried about. I'm worried about the people who seek across the border from other places in the world that hate us, that want to cause harm to us. That's what we have to watch out for. So anyway, she goes on and says, we believe that approximately 9,400 people have been bused to D.C. from Texas and Arizona since April. Less than 10,000 people. Less than 10,000 people in D.C. And that's creating a humanitarian crisis. In DC, imagine what it imagine what happens when you get a half a million people show show up on the borders on some of these small border towns. We don't have any resources for this. Zero, none. The vast majority of, of people move on to found destinations outside of DC to better respond to this ongoing humanitarian crisis. Uh, yesterday, I announced that we are establishing an Office of Migrant Services. Through that office, the district will be able to set up a framework to meet all buses and facilitate onward travel. How are y'all doing? Here's a ticket, Minnesota. Here's a ticket, Atlanta. Here's a ticket. Y'all can't stay here. How, is, how does that meet the Washingtonians' va values? So what is your values? It's your problem, but we don't want them here. We don't want them where we live. It's the not in my backyard values. 
triage the needs of the people arriving in Washington, D.C. and attend to their basic needs and set up a system distinct from the homeless services system that is tailored uh, that is tailored to the needs of migrants. Yeah, the needs of migrants, I need to get, a, I need to get the, the hell up out of here. Got enough homeless people. Bowser wrote, chiding Republican Governor Doug Ducey and Greg Abbott for shipping illegal immigrants um, from border towns. With this plan, we are staying true to our DC values. How? Now, these small border pans, towns were doing a lot the same. They just don't have the resources. They're tiny little towns. Bowser announced that the move, despite the nation's capital being a leftist sanctuary city, a leftist sanctuary city. That was a sanctuary city. So it's not a sanctuary city? Is DC. A is D.C. a sanctuary city or is it not a sanctuary city? Or, or it, what? Lord of mercy. That's what's going on. All right, we're going to take a little break. We'll be back with more of the program right after these messages. All right. Welcome back. Welcome back to the program. My name is Willie Lawson. This is the Morning Report. The Morning Report is a production of FightBackMedia.com, 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 and FightBackMediaTV.com. It is a gas to be in a seat again, be here uh, with you. And um, let's get on with the thing. Let's get on with the thing. Let's see if I can. There you go. Got to find where the, remember, got to find where the, <laughs> where the right tab is. Um. Sort of piggy, piggybacking on that last story, um, people are. You know, I, 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 I want you to be encouraged because there are people who are standing up against what's going on. Uh, there are. You know, I don't know if there's nearly enough of them. Uh, I, I, I don't know whether they're going to be able to to sustain uh, what we're doing. I don't know whether they're going to be able to be strong enough to um, stand against the um, the flood that's coming because there's a flood coming for sure. Uh, but this week, uh, the Miami-Dade School Board, huge school board, one of the largest school districts in the country, voted against a proposal that will have observed October, 20, October 2022 as LGBTQ History Month. Wow, that's, that's big being in Miami-Dade. The school board, which oversees a district of over 330,000, um, held a public meeting over the proposal. Ultimately, the board voted eight to one against it, as it is likely conflicted with the Florida Parental Rights and Education Bill. And people asking, well, well, how? Well, because in order to have this history, what do you have to, exp I mean, what do you have to explain? What do you have to explain? You have to explain what LGBTQ is and who do you have to explain it to? You have to explain it. You, you have to be very careful because you might end up explaining it to kids who are in third grade, from kindergarten to third grade. And that will be illegal in the state of Florida. That parents said, no, thank you, don't want you talking to my seven-year-old about what gay is. I don't want you talking to my seven-year-old about what a queer is. I don't want you talking to my seven-year-old about bisexuality. I don't want you talking to my six-year-old about lesbianism. I don't want you talking to my eight-year-old about transgenderism. I don't want you doing that. Now, you can call me whatever you want to call me. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care. I don't. I mean, I don't care. And I guess you are within your rights to call me whatever you think. I guess. But this is what the Florida bill is all about. The Florida bill is exactly what I just said. I do not want my kids' teachers or anybody coming into that building talking to my six-year-old about transgenderism. 
explaining that I woke up and I feel like a girl. And so I actually had surgery and got boobs and a vagina and had my tallywhacker removed. I'm sorry, I shouldn't use the word tallywhacker. Tally tallywhacker sort of doesn't make it very serious, I know. The proposal was pushed by a board member, Lucia Baez Geller, who wrote that the LGBTQ individuals have made and continue to make lasting contributions to strengthen the fabric of American society. That's debatable, but okay. On Wednesday, Baez Geller claimed that the symbolic gesture was derailed by ugly falsities and plain, plain disinformation. Of course, you're wrong. This item does not indoctrinate students. It does not force agenda on students. It certainly does. You take a day or a month and you go, we are going to recognize this as legitimate. I, I, I don't want you doing that to my kid. And as was stated incorrectly, this item does not take away parental choice. Well, if the whole district, if the whole, if the whole district is celebrating or recognizing LGBTQ plus, then how do, do how do parents get away from it? Reported the members of the audience groaned <laughs> as Baez Geller issued these remarks because they were saying, "Well, how if the entire district, all three hundred and thirty thousand students, if every school is participating in this?" How do I escape it? I don't want it. If it's one assembly, I can have my kid not go to that assembly. If it's one lunch, I can have my kid not go. If it's one movie, I can have my kid not see it. But this is a, if this is going to be a district-wide thing, there'll be what? There'll be everything. There'll be flags. There'll be speakers. There'll be, they'll be recognizing people. All of it. So how do I, how do you escape it? Y'all know how to escape it, right? I've never been a fan of homeschooling because I don't think everybody can do it. I really don't. Because I believe that teaching, uh, educating is, is something special. And not, and not everybody can do it. And not everybody should even try to do it. You know, for those of you, you know, who've been following me for a while, you know that uh, my main, main profession is is teaching music. Uh, I'm a saxophone teacher. I'm a saxophone teacher. And when my kid, whose birthday is today, happy birthday, Alex, um, wanted to play saxophone for a little bit um, in middle school, uh, people asked me if I was going to teach him. I said, oh, no. Teaching your own kid? And they should. I did teach him to drive. Well, he had driver's ed, too, and I, I helped him. Um, but, but I, but I thought, you know, we've, I've got friends. I have super good friends. Uncle Ted could help you with that. If you ever need it, he'd be happy and he'd be happy to he'd be thrilled to uncle Danny could help you. These aren't his real uncles. These are my, these are my dear friends. You know what I'm saying? Teaching my own kids, something like that. Uh, no, so, so homeschooling, not for everybody, but it, it may be an option to get your kids out of this mess. Uh, Florida Parental Rights um, and Education Law, House Bill 1557 took effect on July 1st. It requires parental involvement in critical decisions affecting students' mental, emotional, or physical well-being at school and requires school districts to notify parents of health care and services, among other things involving their children. In addition, the law states classroom instruction by school personnel or third parties on sexual orientation or gender identity may not occur in kindergarten uh, through third through grade three or in a manner that is not age appropriate, appropriate or developmentally appropriate for students in accordance with state standards. Okay, so not only do we not want you talking to my seventh grader or my seven-year-old about what trans, what a transgender person is, or what a, what a gay person is, what makes somebody gay, or what makes somebody a lesbian. Don't want you talking to my seven-year-old about that, thank you. I also don't want you talking to my 10-year-old about kink. Well, 
board uh, member, Christine Franco, who voted against the school board measure said, I do believe that this is in direct violation with the parental, uh, our parental rights bill. If not so directly in the spirit, it is, she said, adding that this is say, saying a full endorsement of the entire district this month. This includes kindergarten through 12th grade. This is just what I said. Perler um, Hansman said, the school board, it was the school board chair said, we have to be in accordance with the law. Our customers are our parents, board member Libby Navarro, who voted against the pro said, we have to be driven to give parents what they are asking us this school system for their children. We have to be driven by, to give parents what they are asking us. That's a really, that's a, you know, I'm surprised, but that's a really, really important phrase. These school boards have to be driven to give parents what they are asking us. This school system for their children. These are not your children. These children belong to these people who are paying the bill. I know you're paying some of it too, but they're paying the majority of it. So the trick is to stand up. If there's something you that that that, that you need thing you need to do, is that you need to stand up. You need to stand up. You need to say something. That's what you need to do. You need to stand up and say something. All right. One more, one more. One more again, please. Remember we were we're told that all our all our elections are fair and 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 um, solid, blah blah blah, all this stuff, and that elections aren't being stolen. And, and, and if you say elections are being stolen, you're some sort of ultra MAGA right wing danger to the democracy person. A Texas Democrat congressman acclaimed that Republicans quote stole end quote a U.S. House seat from another Democrat during a special election. Representative Vicente Gonzalez, Democrat, you know, we always put that Spanish affectation on words like Gonzalez. I mean, watch, watch your regular news, they do that all the time. Uh, <laughs> so I did it for fun here. Uh, Representative Vicente, Vicente Gonzalez, Democrat from um, Texas, accused Representative Myra Flores, Republican from Texas, of stealing the election away from him. When she beat him in a special election, in the Texas, Texas, in the Texas 34th Congressional District. Our democracy is at stake. There's millions and millions of dollars from outside our region and outside our state that are coming here to try to steal our elections and take away your value and take away the process that we rely on, which is elections. Give me a minute. Give me a minute. Do you have any idea, perhaps you do, how much money is coming into Florida to make sure that Val Demings beats Marco Rubio for that Senate seat? Do you have any idea how much money is coming into Florida to ensure that Charlie Crist beats Ron DeSantis in, that, in, that, in this gubernatorial race? Do you have any idea? It's millions of dollars. It even may be in the bill in, in the senatorial race. It may be it may be a billion dollars or or more. They had Val Demings had commercials up, uh, you know, on the air uh, on TV commercials up way before Mark Rubio was able to do so. It is insane. It may end up being one of the most expensive campaigns in the history of this country. So this Gonzalez, Presente Gonzalez, who's talking about outside money, uh, pot calling kettle, pot calling kettle. We can't compete with the Koch brothers. We can't compete with big oil or big tobacco and the NRA 
They can outspend us, but they can't outwork us, Gonzalez says. Uh, the Democrat was soured by the fact that Flores won, hence the reason why he felt he had to accuse Republicans of so-called stealing the election whip. People on this platform, on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook, got their accounts shut down because they dared to question the veracity of the election in 2020. And here is this, here is this person in the Congress, 34th Congressional District of Texas saying that the election was stolen. They stole the last election. They, they, they spent $3 million to our $250,000. They campaigned for two years and they still only won by less than 1%. So, so the way to turn this around is to get out and vote. Yeah, they spent more money than you did. Yes, is there uh, is there too much money in these campaigns? Absolutely. Is it ever going to stop? Not on your life. But whining and complaining and bitching about it was stolen. What we have heard is that that's not good for the, the democracy. The democracy is who the people vote for. That's what we've heard. Isn't that what you heard? My name is Blaine Lawson. This has been the Morning Report. The Morning Report is a production of fightbackmedia.com, 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 and fightbackmediatv.com. Until we see you again, go out there and learn something, love somebody, and for goodness sakes, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, take care of yourself. We'll see you when we see you. Bye-bye now.